Which is better, a ratchet wrench or an impact wrench? What would you say? Well, the answer would probably depend on what job you needed done. If you're going to take a tire off of a car, the impact wrench is probably the better tool. It's going to go faster, it's going to be a lot easier. You could use a ratchet wrench, it would just bang up your knuckles and be a little bit harder. But if you're working in the engine well of a car, the ratchet wrench is way better because the impact wrench is going to be too powerful. It might break things, it'll get in the way, it's not going to fit. But that socket, that ratchet wrench, you can get right in there and do the work. But both tools do the basically the same job. They turn things. Now, the same can be said for outreach tools. The outreach tools that we have, we have a lot of different tools. But certain tools are better for certain situations. Now, they all drive at the same goal, getting people into Christ, but the specific tools may differ for different people. Now, we're going to stop just for a second here and make sure we clarify. When we're talking about outreach tools, we're not talking about changing the method or the me message. Blah. The gospel stays the same, as has been said a number of times this week. The message stays the same. The gospel is the same back then as it is today, as it will be in the future. But how we go and bring that message to people may differ a little bit. Specifically, in my 45 minutes, we'll be talking about tech-based outreach tools. And we've already had a really good intro to this with the lessons we've had already because we've already talked about a lot of the ways that the early church took the gospel. Let's think about those early outreach tools for just a minute. You think about what happened in Acts 2. What tools did the apostles use? Of course, they preached, but they used the temple as a tool. What a great opportunity to preach the gospel in the temple. Philip used Samaria, going down to Samaria. Now you think about the situation of that, and he was being pushed out of his home. They were dispersing because of oppression, of persecution, but yet they used that as a tool to spread the gospel. And going on with that, as was brought out earlier, Philip then teaches the Ethiopian eunuch. But what tool did he use there? He ran beside a chariot. Think about that for a second. He's running along next to a chariot, saying, hey, what are you reading there? Can I teach you more? And he gets invited into that, to, into that chariot, and he teaches the gentleman the gospel. Someone was baptized. Think about Peter. He didn't necessarily want to, but he went into the home of a Gentile. Oh, and of course, the, the Jews, they didn't like Gentiles. It was a big no-no for a Jewish man to go into the home of a Gentile and teach. Now, of course, God had to do some major prodding to get that to happen. But it did. And Cornelius and his whole household were converted. Or you think about Paul and his tools he used. He would preach in synagogues. He would preach in marketplaces. He would preach on the Areopagus, the place where the philosophers would gather together to discuss new and interesting ideas. He used whatever tools were at his disposal. Now you may be saying, but David, each time he preached, each time those various people preached. Absolutely, you're right. But the venues, the tools changed, and their approach in any given situation changed as was been brought out already. When one of the apostles was teaching to the Jews, they talked about the Jewish history and how Jesus was the promised Messiah. But then when talking to the Gentiles, say in the marketplaces, Paul would talk about how they were very religious people and you have these ideas and he'd tie their philosophy in together with the Bible to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. The tools he used changed for any given situation. Now, I want to build for us a slightly humorous analogy. Think about those Roman roads. And what a boon to the gospel the Roman roads were. Because of the Roman roads and their really good highway network, the gospel was able to be taken all around the Roman world very, very quickly. But, imagine for a second if an early Christian looked at those Roman roads and said, you know, those roads could be really helpful for getting the gospel from here to there very quickly. 
But you know those roads were built to transport Roman troops to invade other lands. They're, they were built for war. And beyond that, when they came back from war, they'd bring back slaves. Those roads are used for slavery. And as you go down those roads, there's, there's lots of bandits. So these roads are used to, to harm innocent people. And even beyond that, there are brothels along these roads. So these roads are used for prostitution. We can't let the gospel be associated with something that's used for war and slavery and theft and prostitution. So we're not going to use Roman roads. How silly would that be? But yet, this is what sometimes we end up doing with tech-based outreach tools because, let's face it, technology can be used for sin. We're not going to pull any punches. We're not going to hide the facts. There is a lot of uses for sin and theft and other things that technology can be used for. But technology can also be used to spread the gospel, to reach people. So, as we're talking about these tech-based outreach tools, let's not focus on all the ways that other people might be using them wrong, but look at how we can use them for the gospel. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover absolutely every technology-based outreach tool. There's just not enough time. But we're going to be hitting some of the ones that I think we can use to the greatest effect. Now, I love the, the subheading for this, <clears throat> integrating the old school with the new school. And this is very important because none of these technology-based outreach tools are intended to replace previous ways things are done. They're not intended to replace any of the stuff that we've talked about already in our lectureship. But they are more tools that we can add into our toolbox to reach more people. One of the teachers at Bear Valley uses the analogy of catching lightning in a bottle. Now, of course, we know you can't literally catch lightning in a bottle, but it's a great analogy. Because if you could catch lightning in a bottle, you would have to have that bottle at the right place, at the right time, for that lightning to strike. Otherwise, you're not going to catch it. And evangelism is much the same way. We need to catch people when they're at a moment where they are receptive to the gospel, where they are ready to listen. And we need to be there to teach them when they're ready. So that means we need to have as many bottles out to catch lightning as possible. Now, when we're talking just one-on-one, -on -one, our own selves, there's no way that I or you can make friends with everybody in our local town. That'd be awesome if we could. It'd be really cool to be able to make personal, one-on-one, -on -one, trusted friends with everybody in our community. But let's face it, we interact with a very small percentage of those people. And so there are many people in Tilden, Northfield, Franklin, that I may never bump into. But they're still a soul. They're still somebody we need to take the gospel to. So these tech-based outreach tools are a way for us to get those bottles out there, to get contact with these people so that we can reach them with the gospel and draw them into a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. Now, as we go forward from here, we're going to look at three main areas. We're going to first look at some reasons why people don't respond to the gospel. And understanding these reasons why people don't respond will help us to see what tools we need to use to overcome those reasons why they don't respond. We're then going to see what I'm going to call indirect evangelism. That is, spreading the net wide. Evangelism that is not directly face-to-face. -face. Then we're going to talk about what's called permission evangelism. And the idea is, just as it sounds, getting permission to evangelize to somebody. And we'll talk about that more when we get there. As we go through this, I don't want anybody to think that because we're talking about technology that they can't think about it or be involved because they're not tech savvy. The things we're talking about don't require you to necessarily be tech savvy. Everybody has a place that they can be in this whole effort. It may be a non-tech based opportunity, but everybody has a part in this evangelism that we're working on. And as all of us work together, the various ages, the various different demographs we have in the congregation, 
we can get the message out there to the most people possible. With that in mind, let's look at some reasons why people don't respond. And as a caveat, none of the information I'm giving you today is my own information. Most of it I got from Bear Valley. A lot of it I got from researching from PTP, Polishing the Pulpit, and other avenues. So don't imagine that I came up with any of this. I'm just spreading other people's news. So some reasons why people don't respond. One reason they don't respond is that they have no perceived need. They don't think they need the gospel. These are the people that when we talk to them and we talk about salvation and sin, they say, I, pff, I don't need that. I'm a good person. Why do I need to be saved? They don't have a perceived need. So to reach them, we need to build that need. We need to show them, yes, you do have sin. You need salvation. Another reason why people might not respond to the gospel is that they don't have enough information. They may feel a need, but they don't respond because they don't know enough. This is why we go and we preach and we teach. This is why Wayne was talking about going through those study outlines to show them all the information they need. But again, sometimes we get in a hurry. And we tell someone, hey, I just met you, but do you want to be a Christian? And they say, oh, what now? Uh, I'm American, does that count? And we say, oh, they're not interested. We didn't give them enough information for them to be interested. So, in our evangelism, we need to make sure we give them enough information that they're making a reasoned decision. Another reason why people may not respond is because the information is coming from what they consider to be a questionable source. Now, we know that we're trustworthy, but they may not know that. And so this is why we talk about so much becoming friends, building a personal relationship, so that when you tell them, this is what the Bible says, they trust you. They know you well enough to know that you have their best interest at heart. Now, I would love it, I'd just love it, if everybody we talked to out there understood Bible authority, and that if the Bible said it, it was trustworthy. But most people don't have that knowledge. Even a lot of people who attend various church buildings don't have that knowledge. And so we need to overcome that hurdle, let them know that we are a trustworthy source. We can do that by becoming their one-on-one -on -one friends so they personally trust us, or being in front of them enough that they trust the name of the church. And we'll talk about that more as we go. So, we've talked about some reasons why people don't respond. Let's now look at what I'm going to call indirect evangelism. And again, this is getting as many bottles out there to catch lightning as possible. To use a biblical analogy, you remember the sower of the seed? And how we broadcast that seed, not just on the field, on the fertile soil, but he broadcast that seed on the road and on the rocks, places that we wouldn't think, why would, why would the farmer go and throw seed on the road? Well, he's broadcasting the seed, he's getting it out there. We are not picking the soil necessarily, but we're getting the seed out there to as many people as we can. Now, the first and most obvious step on this is a website. Having a good church website. Now, I'm going to pause again for just a second here. Some of the things we're talking about today are more congregation-oriented, something that the congregation as a whole does. But a lot of the things we're going to be talking about are things that individuals can do in their own time. So, we'll talk about both so everybody gets a little bit of what we're talking about. Now, why would it be important for the congregation to have a good website? Well, the day and age we live in, most of the time now people, before they do anything, they research it online. And we don't have to go far for this study. Think about yourself. If you're going to buy a toaster, what do you do? You go look at reviews. If you're going to buy a new TV, you go look on Forbes, see which is the best deal. You can buy a new car, you go to Kelly Blue Book and you look at the values. You're going to go on a vacation and you go to Hotels.com and see who has the best rates. If you're going to go visit a new church, you go to their website. So, oftentimes, even for unchurched people, their first contact with the church is going to be through the website. Amen. And so we need to have websites that are effective. Now, a website 
can be a daunting thing. I'm using ours because I didn't have to get any permission to use this image. Um, but a, a website can be a daunting thing because to have a good quality website, well, it has to look good. It has to function well. And in the past, to have a good functioning website, you had to know code. You had to be able to program in HTML, and that was really daunting and oftentimes poorly done. And so you end up with church websites that links don't work, and all the sizing gets all weird, and it's a million years out of date because the person who knew HTML moved away 10 years ago. But luckily, we don't live in that day and age anymore. Now, there are website builders that are drag and drop. You just use one of their templates, you put your information where you want it, type in your stuff, and then hit publish. And you're ready to rock and roll. So if you can build a document on Microsoft Publisher, or the equivalent in the Apple world, you can build a website. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the various options for website building. I have a handout available for that. So if the congregation where you're at is looking to build or upgrade a website and you need information about that, get with me afterwards. I can give you a handout that has some of that information. But the actual building of the website aside for a sec, when we're looking at a website, we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of the website? Oftentimes, us tech people get super enthralled with just the idea of the technology that we forget the purpose. We get so excited about, hey, a website, and we can make it do this, and we can make it do that, that we forget to ask the question, why? So what is the purpose of a church website? Well, the purpose of a church website is to get people in the door. The purpose is to get them into a situation where you can become friends with them, that you can meet them one-on-one, -on -one, that you can get that one-on-one -on -one Bible study with them. You want to get them in the door to meet you so that you can teach them. What a cool idea, them coming to you, right? So with this goal in mind, there's a few things that a website must be or have. First, a website must look professional. This should be a no-brainer. But if we just think about our own personal appearance, when we were going on campaigns with Bear Valley, they had us dress a particular way. Why? Because we're representing Christ and we're representing the church and we want people to see us as professionals, not as vagabonds. You don't want to go out looking like a 70s con artist to spread the gospel because people will assume that your message fits your presentation. And our church website should not look to use the, the term loosely, like a 70s con artist. We don't want them to look unprofessional and shoddy or misleading because then people will look at it and say, you know what, I don't want to go there. Just thinking about yourself, how often have you visited a business's website and thought, you know, I'm not going to buy from them because they look like the kind of place that might steal my credit card number. And you go to the other website that looks more professional. The look matters. Beyond that, a website must include location and meeting times. This is so important. If you're going to get them in the door, they have to know where the door is and what time the door is open. Now, confession time. Uh, when I was going through this, I was like, hey, let's check out our website and make sure these things are fitting. Well, it turns out our website, up until about a week ago, the meeting time was on one page and the location was on a different page. So to get the location and meeting time, you had to go navigate to two different pages. That's my bad. Um, I built the website with my sister-in-law's help, so it's my fault. Um, so we had to, I had to modify the website so that the meeting times and locations were on the first page, front and center, where you could see it, where you could get to it, so that someone who navigates to the very first page knew where to go and when to be there. So you have to have that. Also, a website must have a basic what we believe page. Now, there's this twofold. First, so that a visiting Christian who's on vacation or something can see whether or not they want to visit. We all do that, don't we? We're going on a trip, we visit congregation websites to make sure that they're non instrumental, that they're not going to be doing anything crazy or anything like that. So we need to have the information that people will want to have. But also, when we're looking at outreach, this is important because people want to know what they're walking into. 
they want to know that when they walk in, they're not going to see a guy with 16 wives who thinks electricity is sin. They want to know that we're pretty normal-ish people who aren't going to be doing crazy things so that we can get them in the door. If they think it's like a, a no-windows cult and we're not going to tell you what happens inside the building until you're in here, they're not going to come. So we need to give them enough information that they want to come in the door. Finally, the website must focus on the positive and the inviting. Again, the goal is to get them in the door. It would be nice if someone read our website and immediately called us up and said, I read your website and I want to be baptized. But honestly, that's probably not going to happen. The goal here isn't for the website to convert them. The goal is not for the website to tell all the denominations how wrong they are. The goal is to get people who are interested in the gospel in the door so we can teach them, so we can show them the gospel. On that note, if we have 16 pages of rants against this, that, this, that and the other thing, well, they're not going to see us as an inviting place. They're going to think they're going to come and get yelled at. So we want the, the website to be positive and inviting. Now, that's kind of a congregation goal, right? Using the website as a congregation thing. Let's now zoom down a little bit and look at something that is still this very broad casting of the message that is more individual, and that is social media. Now, social media can get a bad rap because a lot of people misuse it. They can misuse it to hurt people. They can misuse it to break copyright rules. There's a lot of ways it can be abused. But it's also where everybody's at. The, some of the previous speakers have talked about meeting people where they're at. And you think about Paul in the Areopagus. He went to where the philosophers were to teach them. Pretty much anybody, we'll say below the age of 40, is going to be on social media. And a lot of people above it. So if we're going to meet them where they're at, we need to be reaching out to them on social media, using this tool to reach people for the gospel. Now, what's the purpose of using social media for outreach? Well, the goal is, again, to get people in the door, to get people to us so that we can teach them one-on-one. -on -one. Now, on that note, we're going to talk about Facebook because it's the most popular right now. We could talk about Twitter or Instagram or any of these things. But we're going to talk about Facebook because almost everybody has a Facebook page. Having a congregation Facebook page is a really good outreach tool. Now, again, I use ours because I didn't have any special permission. The congregation Facebook page can be a good launching point for any individual to use Facebook for evangelism. The congregation posts things like sermon recordings, devotionals, event, uh, announcements, things of that nature. And the members of the congregation can like and share those things. And here's what happens. When you share something from the congregation Facebook page, all your friends see it. So you've just taken, the, say, the sermon that was preached on Sunday and put it in front of however many, 300, 400, 1,000 friends that you have on Facebook. The gospel is getting in front of people. So, also, people that like the congregation Facebook page then also see it. So we're getting the opportunity. People are giving us permission, as it were, when they like our page or when we share the content, to get that in front of far more people than we could actually fit inside the building. Now, what's that do? It puts our name out there. People see it. People start to recognize it. And people, hopefully, will start to build trust in the Church of Christ whose members are posting these encouraging, uplifting, educational things. Now, there's some important things to take note of with a congregation Facebook page. And this does not go for your personal page. This is more about the congregation Facebook page. The congregation's Facebook page is not for rants. Rants can hurt the church because we get on and we post how we're just so mad about this or that or the other thing and someone else says, well, I'm mad that you're mad and pretty soon there's an argument where we're trying to encourage people to come to listen to the gospel and instead they're getting arguments. 
the fa Congregation Facebook page is also not for politics. The church is not a politics-based organization. We are not affiliated or tied with any political party or agenda. We are all for Christ and His agenda. So politics, you can do it on your own pages, all you want. That's great. But the congregation's Facebook page should be kept clear of that. And I would say if you're using your personal page for outreach purposes, you might want to keep rants and politics off of it also, but that's your own decision. Also, the congregation's Facebook page is not for memes. Memes are hilarious. Now, if you don't know what a meme is, a meme is a funny picture with a funny phrase that makes everybody laugh or shows some irony or something of that nature. It's just a funny picture. That's great on your own personal Facebook page. But on the congregation Facebook page, that's probably not a good idea. The congregation Facebook page is for outreach and edification. Reaching people with the gospel. That being said, the things that we've talked about here could be applied to any of the social media sites. Twitter, YouTube, Google+, any of those things. You can use these to spread the gospel, but you have to be careful about what content you're putting on there. Now, that's the website, the social media is more of a broadcasting to the multitudes. Let's now get a little more focused and talk about what's called permission evangelism. Permission evangelism is, as it sounds, getting permission to evangelize. And it's really kind of a cool idea because you're getting somebody to say, yes, please teach me the gospel. That's great. Now, permission evangelism works so well today because the culture we live in. There was a time when people loved just being contacted by anybody, whether it was a cold contact phone call or piece of mail in their mailbox or visit at the door. There's a comedian who did a, a routine about this, how back when he was a kid, someone knocks on the door and, oh, everybody's excited. All the kids come to the front room. Mom pulls out a cake and gets some coffee on. Come in, meet the family, have some cake, have some coffee, sit down, enjoy yourself. And so you could go and knock on a neighbor's door and be like, hey, I don't know you, but you want to sit down and chat? And they'd be like, yeah, that'd be great. Come on in. But today, people don't are very suspicious of cold contacts. And for a case study, think about yourself. How often when you look at your phone and it's at a number you don't recognize, do you answer it? Most people, if they don't recognize the phone number, they don't answer it. There's some of us who have to because we get business or church related phone calls and so we have to answer every phone call. But most of the time, if you don't know the number, people aren't going to answer it. Same goes for pieces of mail. You get a piece of mail from somebody you don't recognize. It's probably going to go in the shred pile because it's probably spam. Same with your emails. You get an email from somebody you recognize. It goes in the spam folder. Someone knocks on the door who you don't, who you don't know. Uh, I'm not interested. Bye. Click. People don't like cold contacts anymore. So if we can get permission, then we can say, hey, you asked me to come talk to you. We're getting permission to teach them the gospel. Now, there are some key concepts to permission evangelism. The first key concept is, well, sounds pretty straightforward, getting permission to keep the conversation open. Simply getting that permission. When you're talking to somebody saying, hey, I'm enjoying this conversation, you mind if we continue it? Or would you like some more information about what, I, what we've been talking about? You get their permission. Then the second principle is giving them time to think. Again, this goes back to that research thing. People today want to research their options. And if they feel pressured into something, they're much less likely to go forward with it. When we're teaching the gospel, we must not make people feel pressured. Otherwise, they're not going to stick. They need to be making a decision for themselves. And the third concept, key concept for mission evangelism is finding their time of change. People when they're in flux, are oftentimes way more receptive to the gospel. Maybe when they're getting married. Maybe when they're having a child. Maybe when somebody in the family's just died. Maybe when they've just got a new job or moved to a new area, bought a new house for the first time. Big life-changing moments are going to make them think a little bit more existentially, to make them think more about the big picture. And that's a good time to catch them with the gospel. 
So if we've already gotten permission to contact them, we've been giving them time to get to know us, and that moment of change is there, and we can say, hey, would you like to have a Bible study? That might be their lightning strike moment. This is all about being there for those lightning strike moments. Now, in case you're taking notes, and I went too fast, again, the key concepts are permission, giving them time to think, and finding their time of change. So, how does this work? How does this whole permission evangelism thing work? Well, first you have to identify and make contact with a person or a group. This sounds really highfalutin, but it's really simple. Basically, you meet people. Maybe when they walk in the doors of the congregation, you've made contact with them. Go shake their, say, their hand, say hi. This might be at a booth, like at a fair. We set up a, a booth at the Franklin Day and at the Tilton Northfield Old Home Day. Meeting people, making contact with people. Could just be the people you run into day to day at the supermarket or your friends or your family or people who come to the website, people that you meet on social media. Make contact with them. But then we have to do the hard part. Once we've made contact, we have to get permission to keep them informed. You make contact and you get that permission. How often have we been at the supermarket and you shake someone's hand and you're talking to them and you have a nice little conversation about the church and then you walk away and they walk away and you realize, I, have, I don't even know their name or maybe I know their name but I have no way to contact them. They seemed vaguely interested in the church but I didn't get any information so I can't follow up. We have to get permission to keep them informed. If they walk in the door, that's easy. You hand them a visitor's card and they fill it out, check the little box on the back that says, yes, send me more information. If it's at a, a booth or something of that nature, again, you have them fill out a contact card saying, hey, we've had a really good conversation here. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Can I give you some more information? They fill out a little thing, just give us their email address, and we're good to go. It might be if you're talking to friends saying, hey, I don't have time to finish this up today, but I'd love to, to continue the conversation. Do you mind if I get just your email address and I'll send you some information? Put it in your phone. Write it on a piece of scratch paper. Write it on the back of a business card. You get that permission. Once you have that permission, they have told you that you can now bring them the gospel. How cool is that? Then you have to communicate with them. Confession time. This is the part that I've fallen down on. Because communicating with people over time takes extra effort. You have to write contact or content to email them. You have to email them. You have to call them. You have to follow up. And this isn't just a call them once, okay, they said no, and keep going. This is continuing to send them information over time. We have to continue that conversation. If we tell them, I have more information for you, we have to follow up. So again, how it works is that you make contact you get permission to stay in contact with them, and you communicate over time with them. So here's the hard questions. Everybody's burning to answer. How do we keep track of the contacts, contacts, and how do we communicate with our contacts? It's great to have a bin full of cards with people's names and email addresses. What do we do with them? And when we're doing that, what do we, what do we send them? Well, this is where a really cool tool called Email Marketing Services comes into play. And again, there's a whole bunch of them. I've got it on the handout if you want the information about individual services. What an email marketing service is, and don't get turned off by the marketing word. Again, it's a tool that the world has developed that we can utilize. It's a system to keep track of all these contacts, to send them the information in such a way that you're not going to get flagged automatically as a spam. Because if you, on your personal, my personal email at gmail.com, send out 100 emails or a one email with 100 people on it, there's a high probability of getting flagged as spam. And when, you, when someone receives an email and it's got a million email addresses on it, it doesn't look as good. These services, they'll send out an individual email to each person, so it's very specific. You can even have them personalized such that when you 
send them an email, it'll automatically fill in their name in the correct spots. This expedites your time a lot. Because then if you have, say, 200 contacts, you're not sitting down and writing 200 emails. That takes a lot of time. So once you've got your email marketing software set up, what do we send them? What do we send them? Well, the one thing we can send them is automated campaigns. And again, this sounds highfalutin, but basically you set up a preset number of emails, four, six, eight, that have information about the church, who we are, what we believe a little bit about, who's Jesus, what is sin, why do I need Jesus, basic information about the church and the Bible. And you set it up such that when you add a new contact to your list, they automatically get this series of emails without you doing anything more. Now, this helps you expedite your time. They're getting the information, but you are not having to sit down and hit the send button every time. Now, this can be abused. You don't want to flood someone's email. You don't want to deluge them. You want to spread this out over time. Again, this is all about keeping the conversation open over time. So, first week they get one email. Two weeks later they get another email. Two weeks later they get another email. So that you're staying in front of them, they are seeing your name, and they're reading your content. And the cool thing about that, this is you can see who's opening which emails. So if you've been sending, say, 10 emails to this one person, they haven't opened any of them, there's a pretty good chance they're not interested in your content. But if somebody has opened all of the emails two or three times, that's a good person to call. Now, you might not have known to call that person otherwise, and they might not have cared before they read your content. But now they are getting to know the name, they're getting to build some trustworthiness, so when you call and say, hey, I'm from the Church of Christ, have you been getting our emails? They can say, yes, I like them. And you've built trust, and you can open that door. Beyond these automated campaigns, you can also send out event information. If there's an event going on, people from the community have said, hey, yes, you can send me information. What a great way to get them to know there's an event they might be interested in, a gospel meeting or a seminar or a youth group activity, whatever it is, getting them that information. You can also send out bulletins. Now, why would you send bulletins to contacts in the community? Well, a few reasons. One, it lets them know that the church is active. Very few people want to go visit a dead church. But if they see that the church is active, that they're doing things, that they, are, they love each other, that they're involved with each other, they will feel like they almost know us when they come to visit us. That's a good thing. But there's a caution, and I've been cautioned about this by, from a few people, and that is you want to be careful what you send out to the wider community in a bulletin. You don't want to send out that um, so-and-so first name, last name is having a prostate surgery on this day at this time, at this place. Joe Schmo in the community doesn't need to know. And... Brother so-and-so may not want that information spread to the rest of the community. So the bulletin that gets sent out to the wider world might need to be edited compared to the one that is being sent out to the congregation. You can also send what's called updated content. This would be sermon recordings, devotionals, things of that nature that show them, again, some of the things we believe, but also that we are an active and moving congregation. Now, if someone has built some interest, they're reading your emails, you contact them, they want more information, you can also send interactive content, correspondence courses, questionnaires, things of that nature. It used to be that correspondence courses had to go through the post, literally on paper, write it down, send it to them, they fill it out, bring it back, check it off. Now you can do it online. So you email somebody a correspondence course, they can study the Bible on their own time, send it back to you, it's all instant. Again, getting the gospel to more people. Sad to say, but there are many young people who would not fill out a paper correspondence course, 
but might open it up on their phone and do it on their phone. Getting the gospel to more people. So, recapping what to send, you can send automated campaigns, event invitations, bulletins, updated content, and interactive content. And there's, there's more you could send, but that's the basics. Now, what's the goal of this? Is, again, is the goal just to have the cool tool? No. The goal is to get people in the door and into Bible studies. Open that door so that you can teach them the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. And those hard-to-crack nuts, those people that when you meet them at the supermarket or at the fair, aren't saying, yes, I want a Bible study right now, but they're willing to listen to a little bit more information, this allows you to keep that conversation going so that maybe down the road, a month, two months, six months, when their lightning strikes, the church they know about is the church of Christ. So, in our last few minutes, here's the big question. Who does this? This is a lot of work. If you go through all the things we've just talked about, and we haven't even covered everything. We haven't covered blogs or vlogs or any of those things. I know, funny words. Who does all this? Well, it can't all be one person. Because congregations like the ones we're involved in that aren't 300 people, we probably don't have the manpower to say, hey, this is our dean of online stuff. Dean, that's the wrong word. Deacon of online stuff. It'd be cool if we did, but probably not. And speaking from experience, preachers have other things to do also. So spending all their time doing internet things is not effective. So who does these things? Well, everyone works together. And this is where this becomes a really cool tool. Because as everybody is doing a part, everybody's involved. Who's sharing things on Facebook? Everybody's got a Facebook page. Who is getting contacts to add to the database? Everybody. Everybody can do this and be part of things. Now, I put together a short list of areas that people could volunteer, just in case people are wondering. Recording operators. If you're recording sermons at your congregation, having somebody run the technology to record that sermon, whether it's video or audio. Content contributors. What's a content contributor? Somebody who writes stuff. It's a big fancy word to mean a writer. So, Maybe you're not technologically inclined, but you love to write. Writing articles, writing emails that then get added to the, the list of preset emails, writing devotionals. Content contributing is a huge part of this. Also, social media admin, administrators. Now, who's the best social media administrators? 25 and under people. Why do I say that? Because they live on social media. They know how the system works. They know what's going to interest their age groups. So you can give them an article that was written by somebody who's not technologically inclined, but they wrote an article. You give it to the social media admin who's 25 or under, whatever, and they put a cool picture with it. They format it so it looks good, and bam! It's up. This goes with putting pictures on the, the Facebook page to let the community know that the congregation is doing stuff. That person doesn't have to be an elder or a preacher, but they can be someone who's trustworthy and willing to take instruction, but is under the leadership of the elders. There's also people that could volunteer for database maintenance. You don't have to know how to program or set up the database to know how to add people to it. In fact, adding people to email the databases is as easy as typing in an email and hitting add. And then you can have people who are watching how many people have gotten these emails, who's gotten which emails, who's opening them, and passing that information on to whoever is making the follow-up calls. They can say, hey, this person has opened all of our emails. You should give them a call. Or this person hasn't opened any emails. We might send some more, but 
probably not worth a call at the moment. Having people doing all these different jobs means that no one person gets overloaded. And none of these are jobs that you need to be a um, college IT level person to do. Anybody that can work a smartphone can do almost any of these things. So, today, as we have been going through the tech-based outreach tools, we've seen that these tech-based outreach tools are not intended to replace the old school methods, but instead they are intended to be integrated with those old school methods. These are not tools that will get people in the waters of baptism and droves, but they are things that will get people in the door, get us contact with them so that we can teach them face to face with the open Bible, show them God's word, and get them in the waters of baptism. These are just more tools we can use so that when someone's lightning strikes, we are there in front of them. And how neat would it be that in whatever town we are in, whether it's here in Tilton or elsewhere, that when somebody who's unchurched has that moment where they're thinking about going to church, that the first church on their mind is the Church of Christ. Because the Church of Christ has gotten in front of them in as many ways as possible. A friend telling them about it in their email, on their Facebook, all over the place, so that they know where to go. And we can all have a part in this if we work together. Thank you, brethren. That is all I have for us at the moment.